All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Jonathan Stewart, and I am an, um, a teacher specialist in Canyon School District. And today we'll be talking back to basics in classroom management. You know, classroom management tends to be something that, that affects all classrooms in all ways. So what we hope to do today is talk about how we can kind of recent ourselves and get back to basics with what we are doing in our classrooms. I hit record. Quickly, we do have our professional development norms. Just make sure you're committed and responsible. And as we have a chance to participate in today's session, make sure that you give opportunity for everyone to speak and listen. Yeah, um, don't don't speak over me. There's too many <laughs> too many voices. I know. Make sure to mute your microphone and turn off your camera if uh, your camera on if you are comfortable. And you can blur your background if you'd like. And if you have any questions, comments, please type it in the chat or it doesn't look like we have a big group today. So just go ahead and call those out. All right, this is our um, MTSS framework. This is our guiding document that guides all things related to instruction and curriculum in the district. And you'll notice that we have a whole section dedicated to behavior. Just wanted to point out that we'll be talking today about the instructional priorities related to behavior and classroom management, and that goes with classroom PIS and positive teacher-student relationships. So our learning intentions is that, is that I will learn or be reminded of the three R's of classroom management, rules, routines, and relationships. And I'll be able to use at least one strategies that I've learned or been reminded of to strengthen my classroom management, again, with those three R's, rules, routine, and relationships. All right, and it looks like, unfortunately, it looks like my screen share was the wrong thing. So let me fix that really quick, let's see. Can you see it now? Okay, great. Step now. You still see it? Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about the importance of classroom management, talk about the three R's of classroom management in this order, rules, routines, and relationships, and a quick reminder about what if charts and precision requests and how they reinforce those three R's. So as we're working with students, you know, we want to make sure we have that time necessary to give devoted to each student. But unfortunately, when classroom management goes awry, we can arrive at something like this where it feels more hectic and chaotic. And sometimes this can be related to factors outside of our control and or impact of what we can do as teachers. But there's a lot of things that we are able to do um, to mitigate this, that we can shore up our classroom management. Um, and, and what I also wanted to point out is that in the we've had a very um, tumultuous two years where a lot of factors outside of control have influenced what goes on inside of our classroom. Just being in the schools, seeing all the first day celebration, it really does feel like the first year we've had a true reset after um, the COVID interruption. So seeing that we have this time as a reset, this is also a time to reset back to make sure we're doing those good practices at work. And that includes evaluating and reflecting on our classroom management practices. So in the, again, we're not talking about anything new. Um, what we'll talk today is not also not new. And as part of this reset, we want to get back to basics. And as I was considering um, several things that we could talk about today, really, I thought these three R's summed up a really good thing to go back and focus and reflect on. It's looking at rules, looking at our routines, and how we're doing with our relationships. And really, when you're doing these 
things, three things really well, you'll find that things go a lot smoother in your classroom. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is rules, and this connects to our instructional priority along the lines of classroom PBIS. This, when we talk about rules, those are where we set the expectation for our classroom. And you'll notice here it talks about when we have rules, routines, and arrangements, meaning the physical arrangement of the space within our classroom. When we are able to do the, all of these things, this allows us to say yes a lot more as a teacher. Because what we don't want is to set up something like we have with Mrs. Muttner here where she likes to go over a few rules that she uses to start the year. A couple of things that I will point out is that there's a lot of rules. I forgot what's in the last first column by the time I read a list of rules in the last column. Everything is about what you can't do. And um, when I work with students that have um, more be challenging behaviors, they're really good at finding loopholes so if you say no making stupid faces, they will make they will do say, well, you didn't say I can't make a stupid face drawing on my arm. And that's not on the list, so that should be permitted. Um, a long time ago, I learned about something with rules called a, a rule of thumb called the dead man rule. So if a dead man can do it, it's not a good rule. If, if you are forbidding something, a dead man can also do that. But if you're saying what students should be doing, that wouldn't pass the dead man rule. We want to avoid this. But what we want to get to is rules that will make our classroom work better. So some general guidelines on classroom rules is that it's a broad principle to help guide behavior for all students to experience success. So you don't want to get too specific. This is something that should apply in multiple times of the day, multiple situations, multiple students that you work with. And it can work across situations. Um, and it helps support teacher-students relationship because it's, it keeps things safe and predictable for students. Again, thinking about um, what we're coming out of the last two years, there was a lot of unpredictability both among adults and teachers. And as we have that predictable environment that feels safe and that um, builds a culture and community of trust, and that's where students will start to open up and allow, allow a space where they can learn, try new things and, um, and be open to feedback. Another thing to keep in mind when you're setting up rules for your classroom is that they should reflect and support your school-wide expectations. So it should be interconnected with what your school is trying to accomplish. So for example, at Sandy Elementary, Angela, what are your school-wide rules and expectations? Sandy Sharks are safe, kind, and responsible. And so if I were a classroom teacher in Sandy Elementary, I would say, okay, what are the ways that we, we are safe in our classroom? How do we show that we are kind and what things will help us to be responsible when we are sitting on the rug, when we are working at our desks, when we are at recess, the all, uh, when, all those sorts of things. So we want to have that, yet there are specific things that we want to promote for behavior in our classroom. For example, it is okay that there's variations with how students go to sharpen their pencils or how um, students line up. That can vary by developmental level, but also vary by just what, you know, what the how the teacher wants to manage this, those things. So you do want to have those things that are specific, but it still should reflect what you're hoping to accomplish with your school and make sure that they're explicit. Um, I was working with a, a brain booster teacher at a school the other day who came from adults. So as we were going through what her rules might look like, um, I pointed out to her that that's the difference between adults and children. Adults, you can say, go over to the corner and grab a computer. And when I pointed out, you may want to have numbered stations and say, okay, 
you need to get up, go to the computer in a single file line and grab the Chromebook that corresponds with the number you've been assigned. Uh, she went, oh, I've worked with adults. I never thought about that. And, and as teachers, I think, you know, as student teaching experiences and obviously our prior classroom experience, we probably have an idea of some of those things, but just remembering that the more explicit you make it, the more likely your students are to comply with the rule that you set out. So the following five characteristics are things that will help make your rules more effective when they're established by the teacher. Again, you want to state in, in positive terms. Talk about what you want the students to do, because you can always come back to what, what do I, you know, what do I need to see here, do, et cetera. Um, that and if a student is misbehaving, you don't have to talk about what they did wrong in that correction, but you can say, okay, what are our expectations? You know, um, you know, we use walking feet. Okay, so I saw running this way. So how how can we show walking feet? Well, we slow down, we, you know, and the student can kind of reflect with you. Having the rules be observable and measurable. So being kind is a great thing, but what does kindness look like? How, how will I know that you're being kind? What are the words I will hear? What are the actions I will see? Because especially for our younger students, these are abstract terms that we need to make real, make alive in situations that they can connect with. Again, simplicity, simple and age appropriate. Um, we, have, we have students at all age and developmental levels. So the simpler and easier we make the rule, more likely the students are to remember it, and the more likely they remember it, the more likely they are to be doing it, especially without having to be reminded or asked. And that's why you want to keep your rules to three to five rules. You'll notice that the school-wide rules for Sandy were off the tongue because it's one word, two words, three words. And having, having just a small list of rules makes it easier for the student to remember, unlike our example with Mrs. Muttner. And again, we want to focus on what the students should be doing and what our students' behavior should be like. These are the types of rules that you may want to consider as you're creating rules. So having a compliance rule, rule for preparation, uh, rule about talking is, I mean, I haven't seen uh, classrooms that don't have a variety of these rules. I would especially encourage something around transition behavior rule. What does it look like when you're switching activities or switching locations within your classroom? That is often a more difficult time for students. And that is where you'll see more behaviors without some good and clear guidance. And I love this quote at the end, do not ever make a rule that you are not prepared to consistently enforce every time, every day. Um, that's where the power comes in is that consistency. That's why the rules usually themselves don't matter nearly as much as what is, what do I consistently enforce? That's what the kids will remember and follow. Now, just because we have the rules doesn't mean the kids learn them. So we need to be able to teach those. This is, this is a quote I often use and I think has been spread around quite a bit, but it's if, if a student doesn't know these certain skills, reading, swimming, driving, multiplying, I can connect to the driving, having taught to my own kids to drive. We teach them. But if a child doesn't know how to behave, do we teach, punish, and why, you know, and the quote points out, why can't we finish that last sentence as automatically as we do the others? And hopefully recognize that by teaching the rules and being explicit about it and practicing it and working on it, just like we would their multiplication tables, just like we would learning, um, learning their letters or phonic sounds, that it will become an automatic skill for our students. So again, to explicitly teach, you need to provide lots of examples, opportunities to practice, give good feedback, role play it, give phys physical examples. Um, and I would make sure that your feedback happens not all at once, but over multiple days. Um, teaching rules, uh, people often feel like, especially as the kids get older, well, I taught them the rules, why sh shouldn't they just do it? 
you need to give feedback over again and don't assume that they they come in with a certain base of knowledge when you get students you should assume okay they may be in school but they don't know what to do in my classroom so it's my job to kind of teach and train and mold them to what i expect in my room and that's going to take some time just like it would take time um, to teach them how to use a writing prompt to write a paragraph or um, or to do um, two-digit addition. That takes practice and you can't assume that you teach it once and they'll get it. They're gonna need repeated practice. And because it's a more, and the more like active they're learning, just like with other modes of learning, the better. The next thing we're gonna talk about is routines. Uh, oftentimes this is also called procedures. And again, you'll notice that's kind of that trifecta of arrangements, how we set up our classroom, rules or the expectations. But the routines are sometimes are referred to as procedures are kind of the how-to guide of how they get around and effectively get what they need in their classroom. And when we do these effectively, these al this allows us as students or allow us as teachers to say yes more often and stay positive with our students. So it's just the accepted process. I used the example earlier about how you sharpen your pencil, how you line up, how you push in your chairs, all of those things. And it's the way that it works in your classroom. It will be slightly different from classroom to classroom, which is why you need to be upfront and be very open with your students about what that will be. The biggest thing this does is it helps maximize instructional time. This is the area where teachers lose the most time in their teaching um, is when it takes, you know, when you don't have an efficient system for passing out your papers, you could lose a couple minutes passing out papers. I think those outside of education say, well, it's only a couple minutes, but as we know in education, every minute is valuable. And the more that we can have these procedures in place, it will maximize that efficiency. And um, this is another instructional priority we have, explicit instruction. And just like you would teach this with a sound wall or something like that, you can do this explicit instruction with teaching your rules and most importantly, your procedures and routines. So you start with I do, you show them how to do it, we do it together. We can do it partners in small groups. And then we get the opportunity to practice independently to make sure they have the routines that we're looking for. And these can be instructional in nature, behavioral in nature, but those routines become very valuable. And again, you can use those same explicit procedures just like you do with academic content. So as you're explicitly teaching these, have these thoughts in your mind. What do they look like? What do they sound like? What will give them a criteria for what success will be? Only establish routines that you will reinforce. So you could have a lot of routines, but only if you reinforce them, are they gonna stick? So make sure to firmly establish the ones that you know you wanna keep and keep going. The other, th and then this is gonna sound a little bit like an oxymoron, but you want to build routines throughout the year as the need arises. Um, if you're noticing that when, and I would say the need arises, the way you're going to know is by the reaction of your students. Um, if you're just noticing that, man, when we come in from recess, it just takes them forever. I'm supposed to start at this time, but it really gets us five minutes to get going. That could be a sign that, hey, I need to build in some routines to make that more efficiently, whether it's how to put the hats, coats, and other winter gear away because we're now in the winter season. Um, whether it's how they line up, whether it's how they come in in the hallway, um, is there a place for them to put the equipment as they come in? Maybe you taught it and they it, it worked well at the beginning of the year, but they need that reteaching based on what the feedback you're getting is from their reaction. And that's, don't be afraid to build in those routines to say, look, we're having problems coming in from recess. Let's reassess this. Let, you know, let's practice coming in from recess and let's make sure we know we know how we're supposed to do this as a class. And again, that teaching and reteaching will, will firm it up in your students' minds. I have a link right here and I'm gonna quickly um, 
show you what it looks like. And it has some labels for elementary and secondary, but I think really for all levels this applies. This is just a list of classroom procedures, also again called routines. Things for your room, small group activities, seat work, little group activities, exchanging papers, returning homework, what to do if you're sick, asking a question. You can see there's, there's a lot of different possible procedures that you may want to consider. What I would challenge you to do, um, either today after we're done or maybe sometime this week, especially since we are in the first week of school, is to look at this list of procedures and say, um, you know, are there things that you're like, oh, I hadn't really considered that and thinking about it? Or if maybe if you've been teaching for a little longer, what are things that I realize, hey, this isn't working for well as for me as I would like to? How might I improve that? And kind of step that out, almost like you would a lesson plan, and then um, create a plan to teach that to your kids. And especially since we're in this beginning part of the year, everything's still new, they're learning everything. This is a great chance to build those good habits that will absolutely pay off in the long run. All right, the last, the last R of the three R's that I wanted to discuss is teacher-student relationships. This is why we're in education. This is why we do what we do. And when you get that relationship of trust over time, it helps you to gain compliance, but it also makes it a place where you get students, it, it fosters growth mindset because you're able to persuade and push students to try and do things that they would be resistant to otherwise. Um, whether that's just, whether that's complying with school rules, whether that's um, helping them um, you know, helping them try that division problem that looks intimidating at first. It's, it, it, it really is a backbone for a lot of what we do. And one of the things to consider is that how we talk to students can have a big impact on how we develop that relationship. This is a book that um, we've been studying with our Brain Booster teachers, but I, I think there's a lot of great wisdom this for all teachers. And so I'm pulling some things from it. And I like this quote that the teacher's words have a tremendous power to support children's academic and social emotional learning. Positive teacher language, so how we use our use of words, note and pace, helps them envision what they can accomplish in your special area, in your classroom, et cetera, that they can see themselves as capable of your learning community, build relationships with you and with their classmates and engage in with attention and enthusiasm. So I wanna highlight two things that it talks about is the language that we can use is reinforcing language and reminding language. Reinforcing language would help us with student behaviors that are working. It helps, it helps, reinforcing language is ascent, again, pointing out the positive things that students are doing. It can help them move past challenges that they might have. And also that's a great strategy if you think about it um, in a group of students or with the whole classroom, that if you have, if you can reinforce, you know, thoughts or thought deep thinking or, you know, someone, you can really encourage the types of inquiry and activities that you can see if you, if you have those leading edge behaviors um, and it helps to work with learning histories. Um, when you're using reinforcing language, being very specific and concrete is, you know, good job. That's not a bad thing, but I like, but it, how much more powerful is it is I like, I like how you, you know, finish that sentence with, with proper punctuation that gives more specifics for the students. So they know what to do, be warm, encouraging, and professionally, um, Emphasize what again what they're doing well, so that you're specific on the on the types of things they're doing. Now, reminding language is there will be times that we need you know students uh, we, we need to remind them to do things so that they can comply with our expectations. These are some times that we will see this more during whole group lessons activities. If they're working independently, they may need reminders about what our what our expectation and what our routine is around voice levels, around um, how we work with partners. Transitions, again, this is a time where a lot of lost 
teaching time occurs, and this is when behaviors can become uh, uh, more problematic. So back to reminding language is you want to set clear expectations ahead of time so that when you're reminding your students, you're reminding them of something that they've already learned or that it has already been discussed. You want to keep your reminders brief and to the point and make sure you have that positive tone, language, and posture. This can get more difficult over the school year. We're all positive right now. It's the third day of school. But over time, you'll, you'll almost have to become a little bit of an actor if the caffeine hasn't kicked in, if you're, you know, you, you had a, you didn't sleep well the night before and you had a bad morning for some reason. You still want to get on that, that stage of, of being a teacher and kind of fake it till you make it almost. And, and try and be positive, even though you're getting your teeth under like, I've asked him to get that pencil for the 500th time. But if this, your students never know that, that's the goal. Um, even, if, even, if, even if you internally need to kind of get there. So I want to, in our last couple minutes together, I want to talk about specifically two strategies that really tie those three R's together of rules, routines, and relationships. The first one I want to talk about is a what if chart. And we're going to go off the screen share. And I brought props today. So this, does it look backwards? OK. This is an example of a what if chart. I'm going to scoot back a little bit so you can see a little bit better. And it talks about what do you do if you don't? What are those positive things? Again, the positive things you're looking for and what will, will students get? And this doesn't always have to be like tangible things. You know, the, notice the badge scans for PBIS rewards. It could be a prize. It could be free time. It could just be a thumbs up, just that acknowledgement. But also you have a, you have a plan for if things don't go well and you have a hierarchy so that students can know in class, if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to, these are the things that I, I know I can turn to. So for example, you know, if I give a direction and I don't get compliance, first I'll get a warning, then I might, might have to move my seat or have a conference or, or some of those things I might, miss a little bit of recess time in a hierarchy. So, so those are some of the things that we can have in one if chart. And one thing we've been trying to be very intentional with our wiser is to use icons and other images so that those with those with language difficulties or maybe just students that are younger developmental level, like kinder or first grade that don't read, but they can still relate to these icons and that it will connect with them. Second thing I wanted to to discuss that ties all together and it goes with the what if chart is precision requests. Basically that is a way that we give direction in a way that is, that is again, that more neutral um, reminding way so that it's a specific format. And I will put a link, I don't have it a link in this in the presentation now, but I will put a link to this anchor chart that you could print for yourself or we, if upon request, we do have some up here at the district office, but it's a, it's a way to give directions to your whole class in a way that's non-threatening and is predictable every time. You give a request, you know, Johnny, please get your pencil out. It's not a question, it's polite, but you're telling the student what you need them to do without asking them and begging them and then it can become a power struggle. You, give them, you wait and you give them an opportunity. You wait five to 10 seconds. Usually you won't hover. You like may circulate around the room and come back, see if they've complied. Then you give them a second request. Johnny, I need you to get out your pencil. Again, wait five or 10 seconds. Then you have your consequences laid out. You've talked to your students about it. They know what to expect. And then you say, okay, Johnny, you did not get your pencil out you get and then go to whatever the kind of the first level consequences on your what if chart. It's a great way to connect those. And the thing about this again, this is pre-planned. 
It's intentional. You don't have to think about on the spot. I was hearing a, a story from a co, uh, actually it was the assistant principal, excuse me, in another building. And they talked about a new teacher and uh, on their very first day, brand new teacher. And they were kind of doing like the countdown five, four, three, two, one. And you could just, and this, this individual is saying, you could see the look on this new teacher's face was, I really don't hope I get to one because if I get to one, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. The way you eliminate that is you, is you have your what if chart, you have a pre-planned set of consequences. And if you're not, you know, if you're newer, you're not quite sure what that looks like, your instructional coach is a great resource for that. And they have some great ideas. We've had um, several trainings plus for their own classroom experience and what they've seen with other teachers. Um, in other classrooms that has really worked well, especially maybe for your grade level or content area. So I'm gonna, okay, let's. <coughs> Uh, went through those. So that ends our time. Okay, do that. Nope, shared the wrong screen. Hold on. Really quick. There we go. So half an hour goes quickly. You're not seeing the right screen, are you? Okay, hold on. Thank you screen. Oh, you do see the thank you screen? Okay. You're good. All right, so we are in the right place. So I just wanted to thank you for joining joining us today and those who may be joining at a later date. Just a reminder that we do have our Canyons U. Um, that is a place where we, it has a wealth of great information and knowledge, a lot surrounding technology, but a lot around instruction and other things as well. This is where you find our Bite Size PD page. We join this live on classroom management, but we have, we have such a, a, a a large uh, resource of topics and it may be something applicable to you today but you may have a question in a month that is where you can find that resource and if you are interested in relicensure credit for watching this video you just have to fill out the survey right here and we can give you um, 0.5 relicensure points um, per video that you watch in Bite Size PD. Are there, do you have any other questions at this time? All right, well, I thank you for joining us today for our Bite Size PD and hope you all have a great day. Thanks for joining us.